The following interview was conducted with Professor Emeritus uh, Ch Ch um, Doug Sutton, <clears throat> structural, uh, Emeritus Structural Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, October 15, 2012 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the uh, former oral history librarian and professor emeritus of library science. Good morning, Doug. Morning. And nice to meet you and Good see to you. See you. Well. Let's talk, uh, tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early years. I was born in uh, Providence, Rhode Island on January 2, 1936, and uh, raised in East Providence, Rhode Island, uh, which in a Near, near suburb, you would call it then. Now it's part of the urban area, but uh, it, uh, it was uh, an excellent upbringing. My parents were, uh, I would say, model parents, uh, both from middle class origins. Uh, my mother was born in Maine and uh, eventually wound up marrying my father, who was a no native of Rhode Islander. And I lived in Rhode Island until I left to come to Purdue, frankly, except for my stay at the University of Maine. Uh, I, uh, early childhood memories are favorable. There were lots of young boys in my uh, age group in the neighborhood, and I learned self-sufficiency from an early age and self-defense, too, by the way. <laughs> Did you have any siblings, any brothers? Or I had... Uh, I have one brother, and he still lives in East Providence, actually in Riverside, which is a village in East Providence. And uh, he's lived there all his life. In fact, except for his two years at Wentworth Institute, he's lived within three or four miles of where oh, we were okay. raised. Yeah. What was grade school like? We're in, 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 in I went to a school, school. Uh, a classical, uh, I guess you would call it silent generation grade school in, uh, in East Providence, uh, walked to school. Uh, Got walked up there and uh, crossed the four-lane street uh, first couple of three days of first grade, and then after that I was on my own, getting over there and back. No crossing guards, nothing. Nobody ever got killed. Anyway, uh, grade school probably had an average of 20, 25 in K, uh, one through six, and actually K came in later on, but there was no K when I was there. Sure. Uh, Excellent teachers. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the teachers in those days were nuns without habits, even in the public schools, which is what that was. Yeah. Uh, they were, had to be unmarried, and they only relaxed that when I was in about the sixth grade. One of the teachers finally got married. They were dedicated to their professions, and frankly, uh, the content and style of the teaching I consider to be superior to much of what they're doing today. They were demanding, yet uh, they understood. And it was a multi-ethnic community. Uh, just about everything you could name. A lot of Portuguese immigrants from the Azores and Cape Verdean Islands in Portugal. Italians, Irish certainly. Uh, even a Chinese guy who was uh, David Chin, whose parents were uh, ran a Chinese, a single Chinese restaurant in town. There was just about everything there, including old Yankee stock, which is what I'm from. Uh, it, uh, a little anecdote, uh, when we were going through the introduction to diversity training back in the 70s, I guess it was, during Age of Aquarius I, uh, they insisted, the dean's office began insisting that we attend these seminars. I refused to go. And when they finally came after me, I told them, look, I don't need to go to this. I was raised in a diversity workshop. <laughs> so. <laughs> Let it be, all right? <laughs> I, uh, uh, the, uh, there was everything, including, by the way, it was multiracial. I have a very close friend of, uh, uh, of color, of a black guy from the, probably from the Cape Verdean Islands, originally immigrant. Uh, one of my classmates in high school was, was incidentally a class officer, uh, later became an Episcopal bishop in the Cleveland area. Uh, we had oh, a very close friend of mine, Portuguese uh, extraction, father was a truck farmer, 
worked, learned to work young, went to the University of Maryland, became a dentist, and then later on operated a big sports facility and restaurant and so forth. Uh, success stories based on uh, a sense of personal responsibility and achievement. And took advantage of the opportunities that were presented. Yes, uh, and, and there was never any doubt. Uh, I don't know how to say this without seeming condescending to the current era, but the fact is that we learned early on through the fact that we had to provide for ourselves to some extent. Self-sufficiency was the norm in my neighborhood, and uh, I told somebody when I retired at age 71 that uh, that, that was the first year that I wasn't out earning a living since I was uh, at one level or another since I was 12 years old. I paper routes, gas, worked in the gas station, worked in uh, almost worked surveying, of course, which is another part of the story. Uh, worked in a grocery store all the time I was in high school. Uh, you name it. Worked on a forest crew. I uh, learned what work was early on. Good for you. Okay. Let's talk a little about high school then. Uh, Where did you go to high school? What was that? <clears throat> Went to East Providence High School. It was, uh, again, uh, junior high and high school. Uh, back in those days, they didn't apologize for what they've come back to now, which is streaming. Uh, uh, when you went to junior high school, you were put in one of X number of divisions that happened to be nine, and one was the best students, and nine were the ones that were the least in terms of intellectual capability. Uh, it doesn't mean they did not provide for everybody up and down the line, but it did, that system did permit you to be in class and compete with uh, people who had uh, like in intellectual abilities and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I think it was a good thing. We had excellent teachers. I, can, I could give you names that would mean nothing, I suppose, to these people, but uh, wonderful teachers in just about every sphere. Uh, Helen Harvey uh, was certainly great. She taught Latin and ancient history, which I still think is as good as some of the freshman year courses they have now, and that was in seventh grade. Celia Mata, who may have been the best teacher I ever had, other than Martin Gutzweiler here. Uh, Alice Waddington, who was a legend, they have a school named after her now. Excellent teachers all the way through that system. Did you go, to, was this a junior high and then you went to senior high? Or yes, high? and oh. it was in this, basically the same building. Oh, okay. Uh, there were 257 of my graduating class in high school. Okay. And, what about uh, of, the, of that class, I was trying to think and thinking ahead for this. I was trying to think of uh, uh, how many of them went to college. And if I had to guess, somewhere between 50 and 75, maybe 100, maybe, 100, maybe I'm being on the low side, but. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I know of others that didn't, who had very successful lives and careers and what they did and so forth. Right, uh, yeah. the, uh, it, was a, it was a good school. Uh, and uh, I've got to admit, though, that I was, I won't say, I, I would say uh, an indifferent student. I, uh, I wanted to achieve, my parents had this one, I won't say requirement, but ambitions for both of our kids, both, both of their children, including me, we were going to go to college. And the reason was that my father, who was a good baseball player in high school, uh, had a scholarship to Brown to play baseball and go to school, and he turned it down because he had to go to work, uh, family support, and so forth. And he always, even though he became later on in life a very good engineer, without portfolio, which was possible then. For the state of Rhode Island, highway design engineer, mm -hmm. uh, he always felt that lack of the education. He always, and so that they made it clear. So I, in preparing myself, I made sure I was gonna be qualified for college. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. What about student, any student organizations in high school? You're in, well, you're no, not so much? Not so much. Okay. Uh, some <laughs> I. You know, I did the usual things, sure. but uh, okay. I was not, 
Uh, academics tend to be gold star kids. Okay. I wasn't. I, uh, I, I was a good student, plenty adequate, good enough to get into uh, the University of Maine, University of Rhode Island, good enough to be invited to listen to the MIT guy when he came to the school. But uh, like I say, I was somewhat indifferent in, at that level. Okay. But I had the mindset that once I went to college, it was going to be to turn the switch to turn the volume up a little bit, and I did. Okay. How did you uh, then you went on to college, and how did you have to select? I selected the University of Maine for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them was that uh, my uncle was a superintendent of school of uh, Union Township, which included Islesboro, in Maine, uh, which included Rockland, Islesboro, et cetera, all that general area. And he was high on the University of Maine. And uh, my mother, of course, came from Maine. And my parents, frankly, wanted to get me the heck out of Rhode Island because they thought that I needed a new environment. Uh, don't get the, get the wrong impression. I wasn't a bad actor or anything. I experimented like everybody else. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, I was not a bad actor. And I was just indifferent, I guess you would say. Yeah, okay. uh, went to the University of Maine. I chose the University of Maine over the University of Rhode Island, probably for that reason, and went up there, and it was one of the better decisions in my life. Uh, was very fortunate to uh, be uh, paired with uh, my college roommate, who is still my close friend to this day, uh, John Thomas, his name was, and uh, he was a good student from Old Orchard, Maine. And uh, I always claimed that the reason I wound up where I did was because of him. And he said, uh-uh, the good influence was you on me. So I don't know. <laughs> well, but, but you know that was funny, that third floor at Dunhall? Well, we'd have 10 guys sitting around in the room. And uh, we'd be sitting there working, you know, but conversing and so forth. And pretty soon they'd drift off and so forth. By the time uh, we had this uh, counselor, resident counselor, I still remember his name, Doc Holliday, they called him. He had a band and so on. Interesting guy. He was, shall we say, an uh, infrequent flyer when it came to being a counselor, but uh, a, a resident, all resident guy. But our section of that floor had the best academic record. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was, he came around and personally thanked all. He said, you guys are really making me look good. <laughs> <laughs> I like being with you guys, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, we both joined TKE, uh, Tor Kappa Epsilon. Another very good decision for me. That The fraternity experience was wonderful for me. Uh, Did you live on in the house? I lived in a house uh, for the last three years. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was it was not Animal House, it wasn't Nerd Collection either. Uh, it was a balanced group of it, and in those days we had a break. See, there were returning veterans from the Korean War, and uh, some from World War II actually, still in play. Now those guys knew where they were going, and so they provided a stabilizing influence on the activity of the of the house, uh, so that. Again, the academic record of our fraternity was at the top of the 17 or 18 fraternities on the campus. They, everybody was pretty serious about their work. Very few slackers, and uh, 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 no more than uh, a low normal amount of uh, uh, partying and stuff like that, uh, on the low side, actually. But on the other hand, those veterans weren't going to be told and be treated like 17 or 18 or 19 sure. year olds, you know, a 20 year old. Right. They, they knew what they had to do to make their way in life and uh, so they set a good example for us but uh, we lived full lives too. So it, right. it, University of Maine was a good experience for me. But I, how large a school was that? Well, you know, there, Is were, that the only there were maybe, uh, I'm thinking there were, there were less than 800 in my graduating class from the university. But on the other hand, it was, Maybe 5,000, okay. I, I want to guess. Uh, 
it was, uh, I, I chose to go into civil engineering, probably because parental influence, but it seems to be a little bit of construction in the Sutton blood anyway, because uh, Ann Stubbs, my mother's maiden name, it, uh, her brothers are both in part-time handyman construction work. Uh, my father, of course, was a highway design engineer. Uh, he wanted me to go in something else, but when I went up there, I had done surveying from when I was 14 years old. I actually went out and was, did the layout work, preliminary layout work, before I was 16 of the what is now a major Catholic cemetery in, in uh, right, not, right near where we lived. Uh, my father was surveyed on the side, you know. And so, you know, it, I had already learned a lot of that stuff, or some of it anyway. Probably not as much as I thought at the time, but uh, anyway, I decided to go into civil engineering. It was great. There was a guy named George Ward, uh, the head's name was Wes Evans, who was very good. George Wardlin, uh, oh, Frank Taylor, who was good influence on me. I worked for him part-time surveying when I was there. I uh, had a great, good, edu really good, solid good. education there. Good. I, I, uh, I don't know how to how to describe it. Uh, it was just right for me. It was out in a way, you know, not too many urban temptations. You, Dango was ten miles away. Orono was small, even by the village of West Lafayette. <laughs> so, Sounds uh, good. It, it was a good school. Yeah. What now, the career path before you came to, what did you do after graduating, before you came to Purdue? Graduated in uh, 1957, and like I said, I did better. I graduated with distinction and third in my class of civil engineers of 36 or so. And uh, there were some good guys in that. I had good careers too, by the way. Uh, went back to my home city, in fact, uh, lived, uh, went back and lived in my parents' home. There weren't apartments and stuff like there are today, you know. And so, went to work for a firm called Charles A. McGuire and Associates. It uh, was the probably the premier consulting firm in the in the state. And uh, this is they did work in the surrounding New England states as well as Rhode Island. About that time, the interstate highway system was starting. Well, when I walked through the door, I, I interviewed, I, my father knew the guy who was the chief draftsman in the bridge department, and uh, so that was kind of an end, but really wasn't this. I went in there and interviewed, and, uh, but my background, I had worked, see, every summer in the highway drafting room for the state of Rhode Island. I even did the better part of the design of a road that still through the middle of Rhode the University of Rhode Island campus when I was working there summers. But anyway, uh, I uh, went in there to interview and uh, went around to see everybody, including the highway and the transportation stuff, because that was what I was going to do, right? But because Joe was in the bridge department, I talked to the head of the bridge department and some of the guys there and interviewed Fred Paulson, who was the uh, the partner, one of the partners, and uh, got an offer. So I, I had an offer from an outfit in Boston too, but I decided to go back. All right, so I went, I walked in the first day with my brown bag lunch, and uh, they said, well, you're going, uh, you'll be working in the bridge department. Now, you know, when I was a senior, working on a senior project, uh, I, I remember sitting in a bar, I was 21, by the way, by then, uh, north of north of uh, Old Town, which is beginning to get out of, out there, if you know Maine at all. And uh, sitting there with a bunch of the guys, and we were commiserating, and I, I remember saying, you know, there's not many things I'm sure of, but the one thing I am sure of is I'm not going to have anything to do with structural engineering. Okay. So I went to work on the first day, and you were in the bridge department. I've been in it ever since. <laughs> it, uh, uh, words of, of wisdom, <laughs> words well, of thought, whatever. Well, you, <laughs> you never know. You never know. Serendipity takes you 
Right. It depends right. on which way the wind blows and what opportunities prevent themselves. And I wish, I, I wish that for every kid today. Yeah. That they are open to opportunities exactly. and maybe don't, don't get too fixed and in their way. Right, right. Yet, on the other hand, be self-directed too. So, I mean, I, and I'll give you two or three more incidents as we go along, but where the winds of fate blew in my direction, right. for which I am always going to be grateful. Right, exactly. I, I worked there for a year and a half, and then uh, w that was the very beginnings of the interstate highway system. See, that was 1957. And they brought a guy in from Boston because uh, he was a little older. He Actually, he got his master's degree from here in 53. He got his bachelor's degree from the University of Rhode Island. His name was Gordon Archibald. <clears throat> and so he and I kind of teamed up, and we worked on stuff together, and... Uh, Obviously, he was mentoring me, but uh, he told me, hey, he said, uh, if you want to you be, get smart and go out and get a master's degree, that's the new thing to do. See, everybody didn't do that then. It was not common at all. Sure, right. It was mostly just a bachelor's degree, and that's it, in engineering, civil engineering. So I listened to him, you know, and he said, and don't go here. Go to the Midwest, to one of the good schools out there. He said, I went to Purdue, it was great. But, you know, Illinois, Northwestern, there's some other good schools out there. Michigan, there's other good schools out there. So, uh, you know, I listened to him. And uh, to think, and, and I began to think, you know something? Uh, Sputnik is just going up. It, it was clear even to somebody at my, at my age that things were evolving and it was going to take a little more. So I took them seriously and I applied. I applied at Northwestern and, and to Illinois and to here. And I got accepted to all three. And you know, I decided to come here for probably two reasons. One was Bud's influence, Archibald's influence. And I, saw, I liked what I saw there and liked the- Did you come to know. visit? You, or not? I, no. no. Oh. Are you kidding? I was all- I mean, okay. okay. I uh, communicated with a guy named Joe Whaley, Joseph Whaley, who was the head of structures uh, area structures at the yeah, time. Purdue? Oh, yeah, oh, here at yeah. Purdue. <clears throat> and uh, later he went on was the director of sponsored programs. Uh, okay. And he was an excellent guy. His letters somehow were more personal. You know, I got a letter from literally a giant offering me a, a actually a little bit bigger pay and assistantship at Illinois. I got assistantship offers from all three of the places, but I, I decided to come to Purdue for those reasons. And so in the fall of 58, I got in my car and uh, drew the stuff out. in the back and drove out to take a look at what the Midwest was all about. And so You'd never been to the middle. I had never been across the mountains. <laughs> like that Are you old kidding? map. It, Anything uh, beyond New York know, drops 35 off. 35 miles in Rhode Island, you've got to understand, it's about like 350 miles anywhere. <laughs> else, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know, yeah. seven miles is like going from here to India or something. Yeah. Anyway, anyway uh, came out here, and I... They ask about, you ask about great decisions here, that was, the decision to do that was a life changer. All right, okay. And then your initial appointment, tell us a little about that and, and then move on your research. You started teaching uh, at all or you did your, after? I, I came here on a teaching assistantship. Okay. Was assigned to ADM Lewis, uh, struggled the first semester or so, and thanks to the Another giant, I, I had a chance of, there were giants in, in civil engineering there. Uh, Marion Scott, Martin Gutzweiler, uh, Jack Goldberg. Gutzweiler and Goldberg were my major professors for the PhD. Uh, actually, Phil Sonneson uh, and, of course, Joe Whaling. Uh, first couple of tests I took here, I. 
studied and studied and studied, but I holed up across the street on Northwestern Avenue where in a little room I had in a rooming house. That was the way it was in those days. And studied and studied, and I come out, I did terribly on those first two tests. So I got, for the first time in my life, I really got very discouraged. So I went in to see Marion Scott and said, hey, you know, I don't think I'm cut out for this. Uh, and uh, he told me, he said, Hold the base. That's that's his words. He said, "All you've all you've done so far is uh, set uh, the goal a little bit higher. It ain't over yet. Don't leave." And you know, I walked out of the door feeling I could do it. And from then on, thank you. And that was. Uh, you, did you know Scotty? I yeah. met him a few times. Very nice person. <clears throat> uh, very, very. A giant. Nice. A giant. Very nice. Those guys were. Yeah. were very, very good. Anyway, uh, uh, was a teaching assistant during those uh, reading papers. And uh, incidentally, uh, I've got to chime in the fact that I think it's an overlooked thing that's changed in the present where they, they still have teaching assistants, but they over, are overlooking the potential training uh, exposure pedagogy exposure that it gives to kids as opposed to research assistantships. Uh, I, they've done away with a lot of them. The support is not there and it's nominal and they're using graders. I, I think they ought to rethink that. Anyway, it was great for me. I had to go to four semesters because I lacked one math course at the University of Maine, which they wanted as a more or less a prereq for the masters here. Did a non-thesis masters. And so I had to stay fourth semester, but the fourth semester I only had to take two courses. And as it happened, Mel Miller, who later went on and had a long career at the University of Massachusetts, had just finished his PhD and was going out there. So Joe Whaling uh, was looking for somebody. And I, for once I got a grill, I went in there and said, hey, Dr. Whaling, I, I only have to take six hours. I'd like to try, uh, you need an instructor? I said, I'd be willing to do that this semester. So he let me, let me do it. So I was a full-time instructor that last semester. And uh, in fact, I had a guy in class who I still know now in the precast <laughs> industry that uh, reminds me of that. Uh, he's almost as old as I am, if not as old. Anyway, uh, that was a good experience. But then I left and I went back to McGuire. Uh, I had been going with my wife uh, d since 57. So we got married in 1960 after we got back there. And I went back to working at McGuire's again. More interstate, but actually a, a bigger breadth of experience. And I, I would probably still be there in engineering today if I hadn't received a letter from Joe Whaling that January. January of 61, uh, I guess it was, saying, hey, uh, we want you to consider coming back, teaching full time and working on a PhD. And so, and he said the pay would be about, which was actually more than I was making there. Of course, you know, Sputnik had gone up, they were emphasizing things then. And uh, so education pays went up a notch or two. I said, I don't know, what do I do? And so we had just had a child in uh, 61, the fall of 61, uh, Ju July of 61. I knew that was coming. Cheryl was born in July. And this is in January. My wife is obviously pregnant with her. I what do I do? Well, I decided to do it. And so, once again, we got in the car, came out here, I found a house on Steely Street, and lived down there for nine years, and started working. And uh, so from 1961 until I retired in 2007, I was teaching at Purdue. That's right. Um, <clears throat> what was your focus? You, know, you taught a lot of courses, but your focus on your research. Well, can you make a comment on that? Yeah. Good. But you know, 
One of the things that I did, which cost me a little bit, uh, I suppose you would say, because I never did get promoted to full professor, and there were reasons for that. Some of it was, frankly, internal politics, because I served on the Senate and ruffled some feathers. But uh, the I like teaching and service. And your awards represent that. Yes, they, I, right. frankly, I've won every award that you can win mm -hmm. here for teaching and uh, over the years and uh, actually over 30 years almost. You like working with students? Yeah, I did. I, I liked working with students and, again, I got the counseling awards too. Right. And uh, so that kind of stuff was what I wanted to do. Now, I did research, was involved in research, uh, kept current. The mantra in those days was you couldn't stay current if you weren't on top of research, which was, as far as I'm concerned, an incorrect assertion. Involvement in knowledge development, yes. Involvement in pure research, no. Now, I'm not anti-research, and I'll tell you more about that later, on the contrary. But for me, uh, being a professor during the era that I had a chance to be a professor was a perfect match for my personality okay. and my interests. And uh, so I focused on that. I taught a lot of courses, uh, and I worked hard at it. I mean, I told somebody jokingly, and I wasn't kidding, that uh, when I came here, starting from when I came here in 61 until I was about maybe about 65 years old, uh, I never worked less than 60 hours a week. And uh, that was just the norm. Uh, you know, grading papers, uh, doing, uh, developing courses, uh, developed a lab that they still use today over there. Uh, that was my interest, the primary interest. Now, I did some research and some good stuff, but didn't publish a lot of papers. In fact, I was remiss on that, and I'll look back and say I, I should have done a little more along those yeah, lines. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in any event, that was what I did. That was my interest. That's what I worked on. Taught as many as five courses in a semester at one time. One of them was a project course, but the kids came to me and asked me to teach them a course in masonry. So I said, okay, if you do most of the work, I'll be involved. And so that was the fifth one. But, uh, and as few as one, but one maybe once. <laughs> Always at least two. And usually big classes, uh, you know, big, seldom less than 30 or so, except the, for the grad courses. Taught at both levels. Taught uh, structural analysis all many, many, many years. Structural concrete, if it, chances are reinforced concrete design for years. After Bob Lee kind of got into other stuff, uh, I bet you I taught that course continuously, just about everybody for at least 20 years or more. Uh, the, uh, when Gus died, uh, Martin Gutzweiler died, and I haven't said enough about him. I mean, to me, he was the model college teacher. And, and that, I'm saying that in recognition that Jack Goldberg himself was excellent too. I mean, in each in their different ways. Right. And uh, Marion Scott equally. But Gus, Gus had it for Purdue because he was from Batesville. He knew it. Anyway, uh, when he died in 83 or so, I think it was 1983, suddenly, after a fishing trip we all went on, all the bunch of faculty guys up to Minnesota died within three or four days. I had to take over teaching the advanced concrete course and did that for years and years and years. Taught pre-stressed concrete, which of course is a primary interest of mine, uh, for years and years and years and years, I don't know, 15, 20 years at least, more. Uh, so yeah, I taught a lot. Redeveloped, took it, actually it was more of a course in experimental analysis. I developed a laboratory, got money from an NSF grant to develop the undergraduate laboratory for that and taught a course at the grad level for experimental structural analysis, and uh, it, it really worked well. It was good for the time. In fact, I think they could profit from it today because it taught the kids 
experimental principles instead of just flipping them out there and okay. shaking them, loose, letting them struggle. You know, but I uh, I enjoyed. Uh, I never had regrets of doing what I did. The um, and you you like you had different formats. You also you did some. Um, did you ever do any vid uh, video uh, videos at all, or more in the classroom? Actually, I got involved uh, in in. I don't know if you remember this, Catherine, but uh, engineering had this uh, outreach program where they had this uh, video classrooms where you would be teaching a class over there in uh, Potter. But uh, it would be broadcast, being broadcast to other sites. So I did that you know, half a dozen times maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it taught me the strengths and weaknesses of uh, indirect contact. I, I I struggle when it comes to this effort to put everything on a computer screen because there is a chemistry in the classroom and, it, and it's not by accident the classroom formats have persevered since the ancient Greeks. And there is a chemistry there that is lacking when it's just strict knowledge Information exchange. Passing along, yeah, that's right. I, I don't right. know. I, uh, did I you did have, that, you yes. Some, did some of your classes include the lab? Worked in the lab? Oh, yeah, almost. Oh. All of them? The, 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 the structural concrete and uh, the reinforced concrete design class at the undergraduate level and reinforced and, and the steel design, which I never taught. It's one of the few courses I never taught. Uh, both have laboratories. And uh, to this day, which it, they, they've been given up at most other schools long since, they both have labs which are basically, for the most part, computational labs. It's a holdover from the good stuff in the former days. There's a laboratory that involves both experiment, at least half, maybe three quarters experimental, in uh, the first course in structural engine, structural analysis. It's a mix of mechanics and materials and structural analysis that uh, civil engineering has. Again, it's still going on today. Actually, I wrote the original outline for that course in the library on the, uh, in civil engineering. It's now a bunch of offices, but uh, one day, and uh, it's still pretty much that same course, CE 270 it is. Uh, got the money for the lab, and, and so they go, you know, it's a, you learn about it, and then you go in there and you do experiments and actually measure some of this stuff. So they still use a lot of that, some of that same equipment, too. Sounds so. good. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about some counseling. You've been, you got some awards for that, too. Well, you know, one of the, one of the signal things that was done in civil engineering in the early 70s, under the leadership of guys like, guys like Marion Scott and, uh, Actually, the school had then, well, I think, with Jack McLaughlin, and uh, who was, by the way, a very excellent school head. Jerry Leonard's, uh, Gil Saddley, I think, was on that committee. Uh, a guy named Ed Kirsch. Uh, anyway, uh, and, and then as a precursor, a guy named Bill Perloff, who was in geotech, and Bob Lee and Aldo Giorgini, who I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, they wrote an initial report saying, hey, you know, the world is changing, we're going to change the curriculum. And it was a little bit radical, but uh, nevertheless it set the tone for a, a major curriculum uh, development that was, and this is a weakness of Purdue, this was really cutting edge stuff. We revised our curriculum and made it what it is today, and it was with minor tweaking is pretty much what they have today. Some not insignificant tweaking, but still it's the same format. Uh, they went through that and they look at the whole pedagogical uh, scheme of things and uh, configured the curriculum accordingly. Okay, it, it just, it, it was a major accomplishment and yet they never, 
publicized it, never made it known, you know, never beat the drum. That, that wasn't the style. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, that wasn't the Purdue way. We just did it, you know, you, you're supposed to do these things. That was kind of the mindset. Anyway, with regard to counseling, one of the features of that, they said, hey, instead of having professional counselors, the way to get the faculty involved with the students is to distribute the counseling among the faculty members. Okay? And so that's what they did. And one of the features of the uh, curriculum was that you could focus on one area. Uh, structures, geotech, uh, transportation, environmental, used to be called sanitary, environmental. And then your counselor would be in that area. That is to say that would be their major interest. Well, that's the way they did it. So that uh, structural engineering has always had a strong majority of the students. I think it's around 70% now, and it's always been 50, 60, 70%. And it's because the jobs, it is, there are a number of reasons. Excellent teaching, uh, there's, there's a number of reasons why that is. Anyway, we are, I always had 10, 12, 14 counselees. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they come in and uh, uh, I help them. I mean, I got to be honest with you. I think, in retrospect, and I've heard this from people that have gone out and come back and said it. Uh, when they needed to be hardballed, I hardballed. But that's the same thing as the well-remembered Professor Barony in industrial engineering. Same thing. Tell them what they really should hear, not what. They'd really, they'd like to hear what that they don't deserve, okay? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I enjoyed that for years and years and years. And uh, uh, you know how this works. This is the Purdue thing, and I, I, I'm afraid it's maybe being lost a little bit. I have a very good friend that I work with in the precast industry, and. One of the standing jokes we have, but you know, because it's happened so many times. First of all, committees in this professional organization, PCI, that I do stuff with, there's hardly one of those major committees in that industry that doesn't have somebody that I taught in class <laughs> sitting out there. And I'm always teasing them. I say, hey, Tom, I had this guy in class. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Purdue has been about. Sure. Oh, yeah. I understand. All right. Uh, I don't know. You got that uh, Ross uh, Judson Award for that, that memorial a couple the, of times. The buck a couple of times, right. uh, the, uh, and the, the all engineering advisory right, award. Yeah, right. Uh, any specific committees in the college or the school? And then we'll talk a little bit. Yes. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the I've Senate. always been involved in uh, the, the undergraduate committee and so lots of committees. Yes. Okay. Uh, and at the engineering level, uh, I was chair of the Committee on Faculty Relations for at least a couple of terms. Uh, probably in the 2000s. Okay. When I was getting along in age. But, uh, and of course, all the university center stuff. Well, I talked a little bit about that. You were the vice chair. The vice well, chair. No, I was chair. Was I was chair, too. Uh, at that time when you became the vice chair, was it that the succession that the next year you would automatically be no. the chair? No, you had okay. to win the election, but still The I vice was. chair, when you took it over, was a new position, was it not? Yeah, well, I, you know something I don't, I don't, I don't, don't remember. In the okay. Senate, when okay. I went there, I served at least for two years as chair of educational policy, okay. and at least for one year, I, I, I'm lousy when it comes to resumes, frankly. but at least for a year and maybe two years as uh, chair of university resources policy. So I get to sit in on all those inner councils. Okay. And then I was vice chair of the Senate and sent chair of the Senate. Okay, okay. I was chair of the Senate. In fact, I was chair of the Senate when uh, we, uh, the uh, fall break officially came into play. I was chair of ed policy when uh, consideration of uh, the plus and minus grades were continued, it was rejected. Uh, chair, when the, uh, the uh, King holiday was adopted and so forth, uh, 
obviously served as representative to the Board of Trustees as chair of the Senate. Right. Uh, there were significant well, things happening. Researchers say that a chair is a one-year term, correct? No, oh, the chair, okay. can, chair is elected and it can be more than one year term. Okay. I served one year okay. and uh, actually was pressed into running again by Bob Ringel, who his name is on the gallery downstairs, but uh, who was a, incidentally a very good friend of mine. He was my assistant coach in baseball. <laughs> but uh, he... Uh, he pressed me to run, and you know, I didn't really want to do it anyway. That was Charlene Sullivan won that election, so I only served for one year. But uh, it was. Uh, and that would have those been were difficult times. That's uh, in the Bering was president. Yeah, it was Bering was president it was around 1990, 91, 92, somewhere okay. in there. Okay. And there were difficult decisions for the university. Again, times were changing, sure. and uh, there were. For very vocal members of the university center who did good things, guys like Steve Citrin and Eskew and Shandell and well, there were numbers who spoke up and said, "Hey, you know, maybe we ought to consider changing this, 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 this." And when it was not a time when administrative fiats went down easily, and I thought, I, I think. Stephen Bering himself, who was, I considered a friend, I got to know him halfway well, uh, would consider it a plus. I know that Ringel did. Uh, it was a healthy interaction type thing and not just top-down administration. And the collegiality was, became, was emphasized because of these vocal people. It, it was a good good time and I thought we did some good things. And Charlene continued that. It's, it's been difficult lately because they've gone to kind of a top-down model here. And uh, I would, I preferred the old model. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna ask, we'll take about an hour, and, but what we can do, I'm gonna ask you this.